everyone. Uh, now we're going to talk about significance testing using computational methods. At some point, we're going to discuss traditional significance testing, at least traditional in the sense that this is how it's commonly taught in statistics classes, uh, using mathematical formulas and all that stuff. I think this lecture, in addition to only using tools available to you now, also gives a good description on how significance testing works and the logic of significance testing, which I greatly appreciate since significance testing is often a topic that's rather misunderstood and uh, underappreciated. So uh, so I, I like the fact that I'm talking about this in a way that uh, kind of uh, avoids the mathematical details and is in fact somewhat useful and is how the developers of significance testing originally thought of significance testing. It uses the same uh, mindset that they used way back in the uh, late 19th, early 20th centuries to develop the significance testing approach. All right. So the idea of significance testing is to test is to search for what's known as statistical in, uh, significance via statistical inference. So what we're trying to do with statistical inference is, de is uh, determine if there is enough evidence to detect an effect uh, or determine the location of a parameter in the presence of noise or random effects where basically we have noisy data and we're going to uh, attempt to uh, get past the noise in the data to uh, make some sort of statement about a hypothesis. So let's suppose that we have a researcher. They're trying to determine if a new drug under study lowers blood pressure. The researcher is going to randomly assign study participants to control groups and treatment groups, and they're going to store uh, the results in R like so. We have a control vector and we have a treatment vector. Is there a difference between the control and treatment group? Well, we can look at the mean of the treatment group and subtract the mean of the control group. And in this case, the difference is negative 10.6, uh, negative 10.75, which is suggesting that the mean of the control group must be larger than the mean of the treatment group. Okay, so that tells us that in the sample, the mean of the control group is larger than the mean of the treatment. Uh, and that's nice, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in the population, there is in fact a difference or even that that difference is in that direction, that the control group has a larger mean than the treatment group. I mean, this seems encouraging from the perspective of the researcher because if they're trying to lower blood pressure, that suggests that the mean of the treatment group is lower than the mean of the control so that this drug, um, which was given to the treatment group, actually has the desired effect. And certainly, if we got a positive number, then we would just stop right here because there, there, it clearly is not the case that the drug is lowering blood pressure. But it doesn't necessarily mean so far that it does, in fact, lower blood pressure since we only have a sample and we want to be able to make a statement about um, whether this would actually be likely um, or whether um, this actually should be extrapolated from the sample to the entire population. So let's suppose that there was not actually a difference in the, in the treatment group and the control group. This data was supposedly obtained via random sampling and applying of some treatment. So the data itself is random. Uh, and if we're going to say that there is no difference between the control group and the treatment group, then the only effect um, uh, that is uh, present is assignment of, control to, uh, of controlling a treatment group. That's... That's the only thing that that exists. Um, there's that's the only thing that's that's uh, so random sampling is just randomly assigning individuals who came from the same population to different groups. So that's the only real source of um, randomness. And basically, this was some random number that we got. So the question is, how likely is it to see a difference like this, a negative ten point seven five? Um, if there was no difference in the control and treatment group, um, or at least in those populations, because we, we have a control and treatment group. That's the language that we're using here. 
Uh, but we, we're, what we're really doing is comparing the mean of population one and population two. Population one in this case um, is the control group. Population two is the treatment group. We're looking at the mean of population two minus the mean of population one. And that doesn't, that, and uh, comparing the means from two different populations doesn't necessarily uh, require some application of uh, treatment. Although, for what it's worth, that's when, when you do have application of treatment, that that is um, how you would think about it. So, we want to assess how likely um, it is to see a difference like this if basically the only basically this is just random and there's no actual difference in the population. So there's actually one population with one mean. Okay. So uh, what we could do is say, all right, if the only thing that matters is assignment of control to treatment group, and that's the only thing that, that that's responsible for the difference that we see, then we could possibly consider all assignments of controlling treatment group and see how many assignments result in a difference at least as large as this one. Because we think of the, the assignment as being random. Individuals were randomly assigned to control and treatment group. And that was the only thing that had any impact. Um, and that um, there is no actual difference in the control and the treatment group um, in terms of the effect on blood pressure. So we're going to see the we're, we're going to assess how likely this result is if there is no difference by looking at um, by looking at uh, mean differences that are at least this large in magnitude in the same direction. So they all need to be negative numbers, but we need to see how many of them are at least this large in magnitude, and if this number doesn't actually seem all if we see many many numbers that are at least this large in magnitude um so which would which we could say at least as contradictory to the idea that uh there is no difference if we see many of these then that would suggest that there is no in fact no difference because this number was just basically the result of random assignment that you only got negative 10.75 because of random assignment and uh, you could have gotten just and 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 uh, it you could have quite likely gotten something even more contradictory. And if that's the case, and that suggests a result like this is not rare, under the uh, belief that there is no difference between these two groups. And if this result is not rare or unusual un under that belief, then we should not reject the belief that there is no difference between the two groups. We should keep it, right? And that's what we would call a null hypothesis, some belief that we adopt going into a study that in some sense we are trying to disprove. On the other hand, if most means are less than this in magnitude, maybe even positive, then that would suggest that it's highly unlikely for this result to be due just to the random assignment between control and treatment. And if it is highly unlikely in that sense that this is the result of uh, control to treatment, then we should reject that initial notion of there being no difference between control and treatment. What we're going to try to do is estimate the probability of seeing a result at least this contradictory to that null hypothesis of no difference um, um, in this data set. So what we could do is look at all the possible combinations or all the possible assignments of control to treatment group. So, and we can do so by using a function called uh, combin or C-O-M-B-N. Uh, this will find all possible combinations of assignment in, uh, uh, of assigning individuals to the treatment group and to the control group. But, well, okay, to the treatment group, which will then, if you're not assigned to the treatment group, you're assigned to the control group, so it reveals who's assigned to the control group. So here's an example of how this function works. We could do COMBN. Um, we could have, uh, well, actually, we don't, so it takes a vector as its first input, so we don't even need to put numbers in. So we could do... Uh, B, C, uh, D, 
and uh, form groups of two. And what we end up with is a matrix where columns correspond to different subsets of uh, this vector A, B, C, D when uh, order doesn't matter. So this is basically finding the combinations of two elements from this population or from this sample space, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, so, and, and you're assuming that order doesn't matter. Okay. So then when we plug in, um, so if we were to instead replace this, uh, with, uh, numbers from one to four, one, two, four, uh, and we're thinking of the numbers one through four of being indices of a length four vector where that length four vector is all individuals. And by choosing two indices in this vector, we are assigning individuals to the treatment group. Then this would could be understood as all possible assignments of numbers in our vector uh, to the treatment group. And anything that isn't in assign that is anything that isn't assigned to treatment is going to automatically be assigned to control, right? So in the first case, one possible assignment to treatment is individual one gets assigned to the treatment group, individual two gets assigned to the treatment group. In which case, individuals three and four will be assigned to the control group. In this case, individual one gets assigned to the treatment group, individual three gets assigned to the treatment group. So individuals two and four will get assigned to the control group. So here are all the possible, um, let, let, so we could imagine basically first uh, taking the control and treatment and pooling them. So we have um, a pooled vector um, of uh, blood pressures for both the control and treatment groups. So and this would basically be all blood pressures. And one possible assignment of control to treatment would be pool one, two, four. We would say that those individuals would constitute uh, the treatment group when actually they were the control group. And everyone else will be the um, uh, control group. Or we could do, for example, uh, five to eight. And we would say, all right, these individuals are going to be assigned to the treatment group. These are their blood pressures. Every other blood pressure will be the control group. Uh, we can do stuff like that. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is get all the potential assignments of uh, control of individuals in the pooled sample to control group and treatment group. And what I do is I just create a vector of length control plus treatment, which I know is going to be eight. And then I'm going to pick four individuals to be, um, I hope, yeah, to be in the treatment group. And this is the resulting matrix. Okay, so each one of these columns corresponds to an assignment of individuals in the pooled sample to the treatment group. So in, here we have indiv individuals one, three, five, and six will be in the treatment group. We will track the blood pressures of those individuals. Everyone else is going to be in the control group. Um, here's... For example, the first four columns, just to give an idea. And in fact, the number of columns of this matrix corresponds to the number of possible combinations. So in this case, uh, there's 70 ways to assign uh, four individuals out of eight to the treatment group. All right. So now here's what we're going to do. We're going to lump. I didn't. So in my original notes, I didn't call it pool. Uh, I'm going to lump all of the control and treatment data into a single pool. So it looks like this. And here's one possible assignment of uh, individuals to the control and treatment group. So here's end. Uh, this represents assigning individuals one, two, three, and seven to the treatment group. In which case this, um, so what we've done here is picking the fourth possible uh, assignment of individuals to the treatment group. Okay, so I've picked the fourth, the fourth one here, got a vector, and we're going to use this vector to then actually get the blood pressures of the individuals in this fictitious treatment group, right? This is a fictitious treatment group, 
not the actual treatment group. Um, and everyone else will be in the control group, and we and we get the blood pressures of those in the control group using negative end. Remember how negative assignments work in that square. Uh, negative vectors work in uh, uh, that square bracket notation. So now, if we wanted to see in this fictitious assignment of treatment to control what the mean difference is between the fictitious treatment group and the fictitious control group, this is what we see. We get uh, 18.75, which is a number that's uh, greater than zero. So this would be, I mean, this uh, seems, um, well, this would basically would be uh, a, a mean difference that actually would confirm in a sense, although confirm is a loaded term. But it's not in disagreement with our belief uh, that there is no difference. Although it might suggest that actually the control the uh, uh, control group is the control group had lower blood pressures, but we're, we 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 either are reducing blood pressure or not doing anything at all in this framework. Okay, so what I want to do is repeat this procedure of getting fictitious treatment groups and a fictitious control group and getting their blood pressures many, many times. So here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to use the apply function. I use the apply function. Um, this matrix ASSN has the assignments. We're going to apply a function over the columns because the columns contain potential assignments. And what we do, given one of those potential assignment vectors, which is a column of this matrix, is compute the mean blood pressure of the fictitious treatment group and subtract the mean blood, pre blood pressure of the fictitious control group. All right, so let's do that. And let's actually look at these differences. All right, so now we have um, what you can think of as a sample space or um, a population of potential uh, differences in mean. And uh, differences less than zero are differences where the uh, treatment group uh, had a lower uh, blood pressure than the control group. So anything that's less than zero corresponds to that. And uh, here, by the way, is negative 10.75. That is the, uh, um, that I think that's actually what we saw in the actual sample. So, uh, all right. Now what we're going to do is decide how unusual our uh, initial difference between the treatment and the control group was. And what we're going to do is say, all right, we have um, we have these differences, diffs. Uh, how many of these differences are less than <coughs> the mean of our treatment group uh, minus the mean of our control group? All right, those are all the differences where it's less. So uh, if we were to add this all up, uh, we find that 11 times out of 70, we got a more extreme result than what we saw. And um, in fact, if we were to replace sum with mean, uh, we get 0 0.1. So about 16% of the time, we get a difference at least as negative as what we actually saw. And then the question is, is this sufficient evidence that our uh, drug that is trying to reduce blood pressure actually reduces blood pressure? Well, 16% of the time, we get a result under uh, pure random sampling where, uh, the, uh, where there's actually no difference in the groups. 16% of the time, we get a result at least as extreme as what we saw. And conventionally in high, in statistics and in any sort of hypothesis testing this is considered um not small enough like it seems almost like 16 percent is rare but in it's usually considered not that rare a 16 percent likelihood outcome is actually considered somewhat common um i mean not not a well i, I guess common's not really a good word for it but it's certainly not rare or extremely unlikely 
if we had seen a number that was less than 0.1 or less than 0.05 or especially less than 0.01, then that actually would suggest that the result that we saw um, is extremely unlikely in the event that there is actually no difference or in the circumstance that there is actually no difference between the treatment and the control group. In which case, we should just reject the notion that there is no difference and accept or, or adopt the notion that there is, in fact, a difference between the two, and um, um, that it's uh, and that uh, the treatment group or that applying this treatment reduces blood pressure. So this is actually not low enough for us to reject the notion that there is no difference between the two groups, or even possibly that uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, control group uh, might actually, you know, maybe it's possible that our treatment up raises blood pressure. It's, I mean, it's it's a possibility. So uh, we can't even necessarily reject that notion either. So, yeah, that's um, how we would. Uh, uh, so so there, so that's how we would we would go about it. This is basically using some exhaustive approach, just checking how, um, uh, how in alignment. Uh, with our beliefs or, 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 or with what we want to find our data in fact is uh, using some exhaustive procedure uh, to see uh, how much variation there is in the data in a sense. All right, let's repeat this procedure again. We're going to consider another problem. In this case, we're going to consider the tooth growth data set. Uh, I've used this data set a few times in my videos. So here's the head of the tooth growth. So here's the first few rows of the tooth growth data set. And uh, this is examining how much uh, guinea pig's teeth grew under different uh, supplemented dosage amounts. All right. So we want to decide whether different supplements produce different tooth growth. And specifically... We're interested in whether, um, let's see. Well, let's see. What am I, what, what, what do I actually check? Uh, okay. So we're, we want to check whether the vitamin C supplement has a smaller tooth growth than the orange juice supplement. So orange juice actually has a better tooth growth. Okay. So, uh, here is, um, so here I computed, the mean uh, uh, tooth growth for both the orange juice and the vitamin C gr groups. And then I actually take the difference uh, to see uh, what the difference in growth was. And now I want to know, uh, well, actually, this is something that I would have probably decided before collecting any data. Whenever you're formulating your hypotheses, you should formulate your hypotheses, if you're going to formulate any at all, prior to data collection. Uh, uh, inference or uh, uh, inference analysis or uh, hypothesis testing is completely meaningless after you have seen the data. It doesn't make sense after you've seen the data to um, form hypotheses and test them. This is something that you have decided beforehand that you are interested in. So you have some uh, like this is basically adopting the traditional notion of science, uh, where in science, uh, you have some greater body of theory and that theory produces hypotheses, potential further implications of the theory. And you've decided that these are your hypotheses. You then collect data, you apply statistical procedures to the data and then decide whether the data actually matches with your, uh, or whether the data coincides with your hypotheses or how it coincides with your hypotheses, whether you're rejecting your null hypothesis or your alternative hypothesis and so on. So, um, when, so, so, that, so it's all a priori. So you have some, uh, a priori beliefs that you're trying to prove or disprove. Uh, yeah. So hypothesis testing, long story short is best done after you have seen the data. Okay, uh, no, uh, 
all right, you develop your hypotheses before you've seen your data, basically, not after. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, we want to decide whether there appears to be a difference between the vitamin C and the orange juice group, and specifically whether uh, vitamin C results in smaller tooth growth or equivalently uh, orange juice results in larger tooth growth than vitamin C. Okay. Um, before, <coughs> sorry, uh, before we were looking exhaustively at all possible combinations of a control and a treatment group. In this case, we do have effectively uh, an, a control and a treatment group, or basically just two groups, where we have a vitamin C group and an orange juice group. So, um, under the belief that there is no difference between the two groups, we would simply... Uh, the only thing that actually matters is the random assignment between orange juice and vitamin C, if there was actually no difference between the two. And we could, in principle, adopt the same approach that we used before, where we look at all possible assignments of orange juice to vitamin C, and or orange juice groups to... of, of guinea pigs to the orange juice group, everybody else gets the vitamin C group. Um, we could look at all possible assignments and then see how often uh, we result in... How often when we compute uh, the difference of vitamin C and, or and orange juice, we get a result at least as negative as this. So we do that, and um, and we do this for all possible combinations, and then we see how many of them result in this, and then we would decide whether uh, this assignment is, is rare or not, or, or this result is rare under that belief or not. And the problem, though in this case, is that there are uh, 60 guinea pigs, and 30 of them were assigned to the orange juice group, and 30 were assigned to the vitamin C group. So the number of possible combinations of, uh, or the number of ways to do this assignment, um, if the assignment's the only thing that matters, is a really big number. I do wonder. Uh, so I wonder, is this the... Uh, is this the uh, largest number? Uh, is this the largest number that that the computer can understand? Uh, is is this the thing that will tell me that? Oh, it's not the largest one. It it, it can consider uh, larger numbers. Okay, so because if if we ended up with a num a number that was too large, then we might say, okay, the reason why. We got that exact number is not because that's the right answer, but because that's the no largest number our computer can understand. Um, because this this number has a potential to be quite large, and that is quite large. Uh, if I were to instead type uh, format, which is how we can possibly control how numbers are printed, uh, we'll do choose uh, 60, 30, and uh, uh, scientific... Scientific equals false. And uh, just to be very friendly to how we've often, uh, you know, humans like to, or people like to separate uh, the tens, like the thousands place from the ten thousands place and so on. You know, they'll put commas in it. So we'll say big mark equals uh, comma to allow for that usual uh, separation to make the number more readable. All right. So the resulting number of combinations is, Let's see, this is millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. Okay, so 118 quadrillion, 264 trillion, 581 billion, 564 million, 861,152. Okay, that's a really big number. Uh, <laughs> that is a really big number, and uh, that suggests that uh, we will never be able to exhaustively search this list for every possible combination of... Um, uh, or every possible assignment of uh, orange juice to vitamin C because our computer is just going to croak. Uh, we will long be dead before we got any answers. So what are we going to do instead? Uh, we have to do something else. What we could do instead is uh, is uh, randomly choose assignments from this uh, space rather than search the entire space. So we will randomly choose them and hopefully we will have a good um, um, 
a, a, a good understanding if we do this random assignment uh, often enough for what the distribution of the difference between the vitamin C and the orange juice groups actually is. So now what we're going to do is from the numbers one through 60, randomly choose 30 without replacement to become our uh, treatment group. In this case, the orange juice group. So, well, actually, no, uh, it looks to me like I'm thinking this is the vitamin C group. Yeah, so we're randomly choosing the vitamin C group here. Okay, so uh, here, for example, is one such assignment. All of the guinea pigs, you imagine each guinea pig gets a number, and all of the guinea pigs with these numbers will be assigned to vitamin to drinking vitamin C, and every other guinea pig will be drinking orange juice. So... Um, this is a fictitious assignment, and then what we do is compute the mean uh, tooth growth uh, for this vi this fictitious vitamin C group and subtract the mean of the tooth growth in the fictitious orange juice group. In this case, we got negative 2.806667. Okay, so this is one potential mean, and then we're going to do this many, many times. We're going to create many, many, many such assignments and see how often uh, in the end we got uh, mean tooth growth lengths uh, in that were um, at least as negative as what we saw. So we're going to replicate again 2,000 times, uh, choosing uh, guinea pigs to be drinking vitamin C fictitiously and then computing the mean difference. So then we do this. Here is uh, our simulated differences. Looks something like this. We can even create something like a histogram. Uh, so a histogram of the simulated differences because what we're doing is, is in a sense, estimating um, a uh, estimating a distribution of a statistic. So estimating a sampling distribution. And this distribution is centered around zero, uh, which is not too surprising. And it also it has that normal looking shape, that bell curve looking shape. And there's a reason for that. It's the law of large numbers. There's a number of guinea pigs being considered here. And uh, looking at this, where was our original uh, uh, difference? It's going to be diff uh, sup means dollar len. So that's uh, negative 3.7. That falls about here, which mean, oh, no, 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 negative 3.7, that's about here. So that means the direction we're interested in is this direction. These were the means at least as extreme as what we actually saw. And all right then, so we can actually compute how many or the proportion of means that were uh, at least as negative as what we saw. And only about 3% of such means were at least as negative as what we saw. Now this, we actually would consider good evidence against the null hypothesis or the belief that there is no difference in the tooth growth. So we should then reject that belief, that hypothesis in favor of the hypothesis that says that orange juice results in higher tooth growth length than vitamin C. And for what it's worth, um, going back up uh, to that original um, example where we were looking at uh, this uh, treat, uh, this uh, blood pressure reducing stuff, we could have constructed a histogram there too, and it would have made sense. Yeah, so so you could have done a similar thing, and it does make sense. Um, yeah, the resulting distribution is very symmetric. Um, and negative uh, 10.75 was about here. So I wonder, we could also probably do, maybe this would be more informative, a density plot, not plost, plot density diffs. And uh, yeah, that's uh, slightly more useful. And in, at some level, the mean that we saw for that group ends up in the fat part of the distribution. And since it ends up in the fat part, it, it that leads us to say we probably should not believe that there is actually a difference um, in the two groups. Whereas if we ended up over here, that would actually lead us to believe that there was a difference. Okay, um, and we could do a similar thing for the uh, uh, for the guinea pigs. 
yeah, so here, let's see. Um, what was the actual difference again? Negative 3.7, so that's about here. Eh, I mean, whether the fat part actually makes sense in this context. I guess that depends on what you mean by that. But, eh, I mean, it's about here. So it's like rare enough to possibly reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, that is my uh, lecture on this. This is a topic that we will be revisiting, but not from the uh, computational perspective, not from this exhaustive search perspective, uh, but more from the, uh, f with a more mathematical uh, approach in a sense. So we will be revisiting this issue, but w I just wanted to show you this for now because I, I did. All right. Have a good day.